Joel, this is for you. Good morning, I'm Tim Shackleton, electrical apprentice and project manager of ePro. Joel's not here today because he is actually wrapping up from the stud pack house down in Houston. We're excited to share that with you down the road here. But in the meantime, we thought we'd keep creating content. Behind me, I have what will be, hopefully, a massive DIY entertainment system. But in the process of building that, I ran into a very little electrical problem that we thought we'd share with you. Let's check it out. If you're curious at all about the built-in section of this project before we get to the electrical, I'm actually borrowing Rogue Engineer's plans off of his channel, so you should go check that out, and we'll make sure to link that for you up in the top right corner. Essentially, I'm gonna have cabinets two and a half feet high, and then from there, I'll just have two wide bookshelves uh, around the TV, framing the TV. We may or may not move the TV up or down and put a shelf above and or below. But the main problem is all right here, right now. In building the base platform for the cabinets, the supports need to fall where the cabinets will go. So I can't move this support, otherwise the whole cabinet will look cattywampus and asymmetrical. But you'll see that the edges of these two cabinets are going to land directly on this receptacle. So I need to move it just a couple inches in either direction. I'm gonna show you how to do that. The other problem that I hope to solve, which is not necessarily related to this project, but is a perfect time to do it, is this cord, this tiny extension cord, which is designed for this purpose, but is really visually cluttered. And so I'm hoping to integrate this plug directly into this plug below. I'll still need a chase for my low voltage wires like this HDMI cord, but that will hide behind the cabinets and be cleaner, less cluttered, and just one fewer point of failure. We've relocated to quickly go over just the wall construction basics if you're a beginner. Normally, the studs of a wall are 16 inches apart to the center. That will come in handy later, so hang on to that. Other than that, there are really only two components. There's often fiberglass insulation in this open bay, and then there's a half inch of drywall mounted to the side of each stud. The studs are called two by fours, but really they're three and a half inches by one and a half inches. So if you add that together, half inch of drywall, three and a half inch of stud, and another half inch of drywall, you're looking at four and a half inches of depth. Normally, all of your electrical boxes will be around that dimension. Sometimes they'll get wider if you need to fit more wire into the box. There are five obstacles that you might run into in the wall though. So you've got your standard construction, insulation, studs, and drywall. The first obstacle you might run into is what is generally overarchingly called blocking. Blocking can look like any abnormal two by four or other beam that's in the wall. I've got two examples here for you. This would be considered blocking. It's not necessarily structural, but it is helping support this PEX panel that I've got here in the basement. Another one might be over here. This stud is not 16 inches to center with the others. And in fact, if I look at them, they are closer to that proper dimension. This is just an additional one. We would call this blocking. It's rare for it to be just random support like this, but sometimes you see it. The most common, especially in older homes, like this 1915 home that we're remodeling here, is fire blocking in which a horizontal run, much like this beam, runs across every joist in your house in order to prevent the spread and chase of fire through the walls. The second thing to be aware of are back-to-back -back walls. This drywall face is actually a closet right back-to-back -back with this utility room. And if you look down here, this receptacle's electrical box actually butts right up to the back of that. So if I was gonna try to drill through this wall from the closet side, this would be invisible to me until I hit it. The same is true in a circular box like this light box. Because it's back to back with that closet, we just need to be mindful of it. The last thing to include in terms of hidden electrical obstacles is the wire itself. If the wire is put in before finished surfaces are up, it's required by code to be supported and secured. And you'll see that here in the stapling at various points. 
So you shouldn't need to worry about wire being open in a wall for the most part. However, there is an exception where there are voids in finished surfaces. Electricians are allowed to fish wire loosely without securement and therefore it could at that point be hanging a little bit more loose. The third obstruction would be the category of metal obstructions and I have two particularly in mind because I like to use magnets as my stud finding source. The first is drywall edges, which are lightweight metal wrapped around drywall corners to give them a nice sharp edge. They are in fact magnetic and might appear to be something else, but if you're at the corner of a wall, that's probably what it is. The second metallic obstacle might be ducting, which is often designed to fit perfectly into stud bays in order to draw air as needed up to second levels. Metal, sometimes discernible through the drywall, sometimes not. The fourth category is brought to you by some minor water damage in my upstairs. Uh, and that would be plaster and lath. Plaster and lath is actually an entirely different construction than drywall. Rather than drilling into studs, lath is nailed across the studs and then plaster is smoothed over the whole surface. If this is the case, it is a lot tougher to find studs. You might have other metal objects like nails, throughout, uh, and it's often thicker as well, not your standard half inch of drywall, but you often have about a quarter to half inch of lath, and then another half inch, maybe even three quarter inch of plaster. So there can be a lot of additional difficulty here. The fifth major category of in-wall obstructions are the invisible ones. And all I can say to this is be ready in case you have emergencies, but there's not much you can do to prepare for them. The first is PEX piping. It's plastic, it's non-magnetic, it's relatively small. Other plumbing too, maybe uh, PVC piping, is really hard to detect. So just do your best. If you notice water coming out of a drill hole, it's probably plumbing and you should address it as quickly as possible. Maybe have someone ready at your water source. The second is insulated duct, which is generally a plastic interior with fiberglass exterior. Again, neither will be easily discernible from a finished wall, but do your best. This one's a little less serious than puncturing a water line. Now I go over those obstacles because we're gonna run into a couple of them in this situation. This receptacle is mounted directly to a stud. It's nailed to it. And I can test that using magnets. This is my favorite way to find studs. There are other tools and maybe methodologies, but this one seems to be the most precise and the most reliable uh, in my experience. If I am looking for the stud on either side, nailed in, all I need to do is wave a magnet over the wall face. And eventually what I'll find is a drywall screw that's holding this drywall to the studs. There's a small chance that if there was some patching to the drywall, that there was some blocking installed and some additional screws. So to check that, I'll just follow the vertical line to see if I can find any more. And sure enough, that does seem to be a stud. Now what I can do is I can measure 16 inches in either direction to look for more. I tricked you because actually this receptacle is mounted to a blocking stud, not an original official stud, which I discovered as I was putting in the platform. In fact, if I again sweep for drywall studs, for drywall screws, I'll find another one just a couple, about 12 inches over. And if I measure from these is where I'll actually find my traditional 16 inch pattern across the wall. They're not vertically aligned, but they are horizontally right around 16, maybe 16 and a half. And I can go the other way, 16,
there's another about 16. That'll help me identify which direction I have space for moving this receptacle. With slightly more understanding of what's going on behind the walls, I'm ready to take off covers and start to look inside. I'm gonna try to leave this HDMI cable that's run behind the wall there. Given I fished it up once and there is a fire block running through this wall, and I'd love to not have to find the, hill, the hole that I drilled through when I originally put that in. You got all kinds of options for testing the powers off. There are tools like this guy. There are what electricians call tick tracers or non-contact voltage testers. Or if you're a DIYer, you're probably fine to just plug in a lamp or a radio or a speaker or something that you can tell from the breaker has changed its status once you flip the correct breaker. We're good here. Now that we have a little better sense of the layout behind the wall, We'll go ahead and kill power, remove the covers, and start looking around. <clears throat> All right, so we've got our left side stud block. Not quite sure what it is. If I track all my wires, this box is getting power from this receptacle through that extension cord up to the TV. And thankfully, we have lots and lots of extra wire there for relocating him. We'll be totally fine. This guy on the other hand has two wires coming in the bottom, neither of which seem to be giving me much to work with. I am gonna see if I can hunt down any staples that might be holding them back and just finagling a little bit See if there's anything I can pull up from the basement or otherwise. So my hope was that I'd get in here and I'd have a service loop on these two non-metallic cables back here. All that means is basically that the electrician almost added a little twist to the wire, kind of like this, so that there was some extra in the wall. But I'm getting nothing. I can't even lean this box all the way out of the wall. I don't see any stables immediately here. So the last thing I'm gonna check is I'm gonna go down to the basement underneath where we are and I should be able to find these wires either with help or in my case with enough experience, I know where I am in my house and where I'm looking and see if I can find any staples that are holding back some of the wire that I can release to give myself just a little bit more slack. Eureka! This is our receptacle. We've got two white wires that is 14 gauge wires coming out of here, and I think I see my problem. It's that, that red stuff is fire caulk. It's similar to the fire block that we talked about earlier in the video. That is for the purpose of denying fire chase up vertically through the home. So I think that's just solidified and polar wire. We also have one more staple back here that I think if I just relocate to this stud, I'll pick up the three to six inches is all I need to just get that receptacle out of the way of that cabinet. The two wires, if you're curious, one is providing power to the receptacle. The other is running from that one to the next receptacle on that circuit on this wall. So I'm loosening this staple, just wedging it a little bit with the screwdriver. It's not even all the way detached yet. I'm just giving myself a little bit more give so that the wire can slide through it, under it. And then we're gonna see if I can't just kind of puncture through this fire caulking. Might even just kind of create some tension on this wire, see if I can't. I do wanna be careful that I'm not rubbing the wire against the wooden subfloor. and marring the outer jacket, because that would compromise its electrical integrity. <sighs> okay, we're back up top. I'm gonna see if we can't just pull just a bit. If I, I'm gonna put another glove on. If I reach from these box holes over to where I think my other stud bay is, or stud, stud, not stud bay. It is right there, I'm touching it. 
with just about a finger's length. So that's really all I need is just to take this guy this way. And in fact, if I can just get clear of this, I could use a remodel box as well. I'm actually thinking probably a screw-in box to this stud would be perfect. A little more secure. All right, Audible, I'm still not quite getting what I need. We're gonna take the wire out of the box. So I'm gonna disconnect this device, put it off to the side and run the wires back out the box. Uh, that'll be a little tricky with the clamps in the back. I'll just have to kind of hold them open. Probably with a screwdriver should work just fine. I'll feed them back down into the basement, drill myself a new hole. And in that decrease of lateral distance, it should increase the amount I need actually to get right up next to it. So let's make some disconnections. Tim from the future here. I've actually finished the job, but I realized I missed a critical point that I should point out. Had we actually needed to relocate to the left of our previous receptacle location, the wire path from the basement would have left us less wire. If that's the case, and I wanted or needed to move left in location, then the best solution is to leave my box in place, make up one length of each color wire that can reach my new location, make those connections in this box, and then cover it with a blank plate. Those junctions do need to be electrically contained, and that's why you do need a box there. They also need to be visible from the finished surface, which is why we put a blank plate there instead of drywalling over it. They need to be accessible and visible. However, this also allows you to cut a pigtail of any desired length so that you could reach in the opposite direction where you need more length as needed. Then you would need a new box, you'd make your terminations into your device, finish it out however you deem best. The only things to make sure that I'm being careful of here are number one, that all the wires were correctly color-coded. The white wires are the neutrals, that is they return back to the panel, um, are on the silver terminals. The bare is the ground, it goes to the green terminal screw. And then the blacks are the actual hot conductors, which always go to the gold or brass terminals. So they'll go back where they belong. If yours is not wired that way, you should wire it as it was wired because you'll actually probably mess up some functionality in the process of changing things. There might be some exceptions to that. If you have a tester that can inform you of what is wrong or missing, if you have a flip neutral, for example, you could go ahead and revert them to the correct color coding, but be, be wary of that. Don't just do it just based on color. Right now we're wrestling this ground because I'd like to have all of this wire length out of the box. Um, there are code standards for wire into the box and wire length out of the box. Um, and I'm worried that if I cut this crimp behind it, I'll get a little bit of length, a functional amount of length to our new location, because I'll get another couple inches, but I will probably not be code sufficient. But I also do feel a little bit of flex in this crimp. So if I can just slide it off, maybe try to just cut it off, then I'm back in the game. Never mind, foolishness. We're gonna cut the ground crimp off and then we'll pigtail back in the new location. Before we go down there, I'm just gonna make sure that I've measured off the correct distance for the wire clearance that I want. Looks like this hole is kind of to right up against the stud. I don't want to be underneath this other stud. So what I'm doing is I'm putting my screwdriver in, I'm marking with my thumb how far I reach there. 
So I want to be inside that distance. So let's go seven inch from. folks let's see if we can go find those all right i know my location for my new box and i'm actually going to cut it now that way i can just pull wire straight up instead of trying to get my wrist in there and then pulling up along where i want the wire uh just makes more sense physics you know um so i'm gonna just get a rough measurement of that height eight inch off the floor Says there, so I'm going about there. Nope. And check for level. Something like that. Now, I want to make sure when I'm marking this that I'm not actually tracing along these tabs because they're the, the thing holding, actually holding the box in place. I want to trace all the narrow portions of the box exclusively. Alrighty. I was ridiculed on a recent video for not owning a jab saw and using an oscillator instead to cut open a panel. Uh, not cut open the panel, cut open the <clears throat> stud bay for a panel. So, Joel, this is for you. Oh, am I in that stud there? I might have gone too far. Okay, so I thought I was hitting the stud before. Oh, I was. I was just at a little angle. Perfect, and would you look at that? Our good friends. Yeah, well, it's plenty of length. Alrighty, now we just wire things up. Actually, I'll check my box size two. A lot of the wire stripping and prep is kind of already done for us here, but uh, we're gonna go in through the clamps in the bottom if you need to. Take a flathead to punch through your new box. But we're reusing ours. And now it is really important, it is uh, code required, that the jacket of your wire enter your box. You can't just have the internal wires. The whole jacketed cable needs to be in there, but only about a quarter of an inch or so. So basically, get it in there with a big shove and then stop, and that's about your quarter inch. Beautiful, now I'm gonna give myself a little bit more because I had to cut off these grounds. There we go. With a safety knife, box cutter, whatever you call it. I'm gonna run the length of the jacket in the box, minding my fingers. Do your best to stay towards the middle where you'll only cut or maybe score not even cut the ground it's kind of your least significant you don't want your hot wire insulation to be sliced It'd be the most dangerous and then fold your wires in the opposite direction of your jacket and just press through get him out nice looking good okay next step pair of wire strippers. You're going to give yourself, what is that dimension? That's actually a little long. What is that, half inch maybe? And whatever part of the tool you want to use, I think Milwaukee advertised that you can use this as your hook or just kind of any pair of pliers. Then fold all these into a nice shepherd's hook. 
many receptacles will have a spot for straight wire to go in. Those are almost always worse as far as electrical connections. So we're good here. We got our wires in. We're ready for terminations. I nearly forgot about our uh, hot pass through, our, our power up to the receptacle behind the TV above me. So I'm going to go ahead and dismantle this and run this into the box <clears throat> as well. A couple push in connectors, so I'm not getting them off. So we're going to remove this plug entirely so I'm not spooking anybody in the future because they don't know that it's not connected to anything. Go ahead. And now I can just replace this box. And that will serve as whoa, electrical enclosure. There we go. All right, screws back on. I'm trying to be a little careful of the drywall here because I've got some, uh, <laughs> some weaknesses, several points. And Whoever left me all this extra wire was very generous, but I think I'm going to trim most of it back now. Through the box, give ourselves a little slack. Whenever you go into both sides of a box, it is always good to give some slack to make sure you can work the box out. <clears throat> Otherwise, by the opposing pressures of the two wires, you can really wedge that thing back in there and then serviceability takes a big hit. So I am going to Try to make sure there's a good, good hardy service loop back there. So we've run into a slight impasse. <clears throat> that is, there's a whole doggone lot of wires in here. We do have a slightly larger box, uh, but it is worth considering your box fill, depending on if you have an additional run like this. If you have three 14 gauge uh, Romex cables, so that's actually nine, I'm sorry, six current carrying conductors and three grounding conductors. Uh, but we should be all right here. Where we're not all right is on the receptacle where we only have two terminals which are only rated for one wire. And so obviously two is less than three. So how do we solve that? Well, this little length of wire that we just cut off <clears throat> from the TV uh, load run, we're gonna repurpose as pigtails along with some wire nuts. Here's what I mean. We're actually gonna straighten out our shepherd's hooks because we are not gonna tie them over the terminals. And in fact, <clears throat> for box fill sake, I'm gonna trim them down. It is important to note as we add more and more wires to this box that the cubic area of the box is determined by the NEC and the manufacturer to a specific number of wires. Now this is a Slater old work box that is a bit deeper than normal, so we are okay here. But if you're only using two wires, you can actually have a shallower box. If you're using more than three, I'm sorry, cables, not wires, more than three Romex cables, you'll need to make sure that you get a box with extra fill. And often they're advertised like that, or you would just look at the actual, uh, cubic inch dimension internally in the box, which is advertised. <clears throat> okay. Now, as we said, because the receptacle only has room for two connections and we have three, we're actually gonna need one additional wire here that will serve as our pigtail. So we're gonna cut that, these guys out. Nice go. We're gonna take the jacket off. And we're gonna strip both ends of each wire. One end is gonna to go to the receptacle. The other is going to go into a wire nut or Wago connector with the other wires of the same colors. This ensures that all of them have access to their necessary terminal. All right, I've got my pigtails. This order is not important. You could either tie them into their 
correct receptacles, re uh, receptacle terminals now, or you could pigtail, you could wire nut everything together first and then do your receptacle last. I'm not sure there's an advantage. It is important that the wires rolled onto the screw in such a manner that when you tighten it, you are actually tightening the wire into the connection. If I had it wrapped around the other direction, as I tighten this up, it would actually try to push the wire out. For my grounds, I actually don't need to pigtail because a grounding wing nut or wire nut actually has a hole in the end for your longest ground so that it can get to the device. And then you can run that down the others and combine them. That should only be the green wire nuts. Don't field modify your other ones to do that. I'd really like to catch this little tooth with the end of my shepherd's hook to ensure a nice quality connection. There it is. Now, I'm starting with my ground because that's the emergency release connection. Now I'm combining my neutrals. All stripped. They're all the same size. That is also important. If you have different size wires, you'll need a different type of connection. Wagos might be a good option. A couple things to look out for with wire nuts. Number one, pre-twisting your wires together might not be a bad idea. I didn't do it here because wire nuts don't actually specify that you must, but it could be wise. You wanna make sure that you're not bulging the wire nut, that you don't actually see the plastic near the end stretching, stressing, so that's okay. And you wanna make sure you're using the right size. I am fairly confident here. I'm between sizes with four 14s. So just for more color coding purposes, I've put a tan on the whites just to further mark the neutrals. And red and black are both hot colors in the electrical world. So that's why I'm putting that guy on there. Okay, now the magic moment that we need to tuck, not stuff, as Joel likes to say, our wires back into the box. Generally, if you've cut right, that should kind of be two folds, one up towards the top of the box and back down or vice versa. We opted to use the same box we used before, which is actually this remodel box. And so it's got these two tabs that when I turn right to tighten, open that flap and then tighten it against the back of the drywall. So I'm making sure that they have enough length that I've loosened them enough that they'll have, in my case, the necessary half inch of the drywall to get to. If you have plaster and lath walls, this Slater box in particular, this gray electrical box, whoo, is your optimal choice because to get around all that plaster, lath, and everything in between, you'll need a good, potentially full inch of, of grabbing space. So I've got that one backed out. This bottom guy, especially, I need to be mindful of because gravity's gonna wanna just pull him down. So the whole time I'm shoving this in, I'm actually holding that tab up into the box with this finger. Um, also note that the tabs are in these locations. You can get boxes with the tabs on the sides, but it's important that that is not mine because I'm actually up next to this other stud or framing member of some kind, um, whichever is which. Uh, so it's important that these open into that free space, not trying to open against that stud where it's not gonna be able to. Now you're just feeling for resistance. You can see it's actually starting to pull itself into the wall. I want to make sure it's nice and tight. 
Same thing up here. Can be tough to feel. I think I did back him off maybe too much. There we go. A little bit of grab, not a ton of pressure. And a cover plate. A flathead. Go ahead and comment below if you're a vertical or horizontal screw guy. Joel's a horizontal guy, so I'm a horizontal guy. That's how I learned, but I could, I could maybe be swayed. Okay, all that's left now is drywall repair and testing of this receptacle. So let's do that and then we'll be off. Down to the breaker panel. So this is a bit of a soft wrap to this project because I haven't finalized where my low voltage cable is going. That said, that's not high risk and doesn't actually need proper electrical enclosure. It is allowed to run behind the wall open. So you don't need any electrical advice there. We've moved the six inches that we needed and I'm still deciding what this placement will be. Subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.